Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Randy Packett, and I am the president and CEO of, of Chesapeake Capital Management. Most of you know who I am. I have worked with you for many years. And then we have some of the participants today. They are new to us. So I welcome you. And as we have done last night, this is our second part of our presentation this month. Uh, for the future, just look forward to more emails to come. Uh, we are going to continue to have more webinars throughout the year. So I'm confident that you will benefit from the information we'll provide you today. And if after the seminar webinars, if you like what we have to say, and there are some information that you need further clarifications, please call our office so we can set up a time to get together either by uh, sitting down together or by Zoom, however way that is most convenient for you. We will be presenting a lot of information today, so please take good notes. And if you have any questions during the time as I'm presenting it, just scroll down your mouse on a computer and where you see the Q&A, just click on that and ask any questions you have. Our staff members are here and they're gather those information and bring it to me so that I'd be able to answer as best as I can. If for some reason we don't get to cover your questions, even though you have submitted, uh, rest assured that we will be getting back to you sometime today, uh, latest tomorrow, with the answers that you're seeking. So once again, thanks for being with us today. So just to give you some of the disclosures, just to let you know, we at Chesapeake Capital, we're, we're an investment advisory firm registered in many states. And obviously, if you're listening to us, you may be mostly in the state of Maryland, Delaware, um, or even Virginia, but we are licensed in Pennsylvania and all the other uh, states, including New Jersey, Florida, and so forth. Anyway, once again, thanks for being with us. Uh, before we get to the main part of our presentations, let's kind of go over what happened with the tax history. The first income tax was proposed in 1814. I don't know if you're aware of that, to help fund the war of the 1812, but the tax never happened because the Treaty of Ghent ended hostilities in 18. 15, which meant the U.S. no longer needed the extra revenue. The first income tax that went into effect happened after the President Lincoln signed the Tax Act of 1862. The law, that law, set aside 3% tax rate on incomes above $600. And anybody making more than $10,000, they, they paid 5% in income taxes. Records show that very few Americans actually filed these taxes. The Tax Act of 1864 raised taxes to continue funding the Civil War. Following the Civil War end, the public began to lose interest in income taxes. Several attempts were made to act permanently keeping this uh, law, but many complaints from business leaders led to them not collecting taxes anymore until in 1913 when the 16th Amendment was ratified, the Congress had authority to tax American citizens' income. Tax rates have fluctuated quite a bit, but I don't know if you're aware how fluctuated it has been over the years. Take a look at this screen. In 1915, the tax rate was only 7%. In 1945, at the end of World War II, it went up to 94% federal tax rate. In 1985, during the Ronald Reagan years, tax rate was as high as 50% in federal rate. And in 2015, it went down to 39.6%. Last year, it was at 37%. But my understanding is there'll be a lot of things gonna change in upcoming years. Uh, we don't know exactly when that will happen, but President-elect Joe Biden, well, I'm sorry, I guess he, uh, Joe Biden is our president now. Uh, he had promised to tax the wealthy people and bring the tax rate up to above 39.6%. Uh, 
that I'm sure there would come at some point during his uh, years in, in the White House. In addition to that, they were talking about raising your capital gains taxes, which we'll go through a little bit more in detail uh, in a few screens down. But keep in mind, taxes will always be with us. So you got to plan. You have to plan for your future even before your retirement. I know many of you are listening is already retired, but keep that in mind. The yeah, best way to pay less taxes is being active about your investments. So Americans who earn more than $200,000 per year pay nearly 60% of all federal income taxes. Americans who earn below 30,000 per year paid 1.4% of all federal income taxes. And Americans who earn more than 2 million, not many of us listening today's making over 2 million, but they pay nearly 21% of all federal income taxes. So today's agenda, I'm gonna cover as much as I can that's listed here. There are eight things, one summary of the Tax Cuts and Job Acts of 2017, two Roth conversion for 2020 and beyond, including 2021, whether it makes sense to do that. We're gonna talk about the healthcare laws and your taxes on that. We're also talk about distribution actions, what you must, to, what you must do this year. We're also gonna talk about where to keep your money we're going to talk about the gift tax exclusions. If you want to give your money away in the future, is that better to wait till then when you're gone or should you start planning it now? And seven, whether to keep your money in the treasury securities or any other tax exam municipal bonds or any type of municipals, we're going to talk briefly about that and how to give your appreciated assets to a charity whether it makes sense to do that. First, let's talk about the summary of the tax cuts and the Job Act of 2017. Well, first, if you have done your taxes last year, you probably realize or last few years, there are a few things have changed in our uh, tax code. One, they raised the government had raised our standard deductions. However, they eliminated the personal exemptions. I recall the last time I really had a benefit of having a lot of personal exemptions were when our kids were living at home. It's been a while since when everyone moved out, but when we were taking care of our kids and there were our dependents, my wife and I, we also had a four daughters. So we had a six personal exemptions in our house during those times. And most of you remember the last time when you were adding up your personal exemption, how much that was in tax deduction wise, it was $3,750 per person. So you add, add it up, but now it's just me and my wife and I, it's just two of us, but they eliminated our personal exemptions. But it also helped us with the raising the standard deductions they are up to $25,100 if you're filing your tax jointly. The federal government, however, capped the state and local tax deductions. So whatever you're paying in local tax or the state tax, they cap at how high you could go up. The maximum tax and what they call salt tax deduction now has a $10,000 cap on it. They did, however, increase the child tax credit and expanded eligibility. Uh, if you have kids living at home or if you have your grandkids or whoever uh, else you may be taking care of, there are still some deductions that you could take and also take the tax credits for anybody who's living at home with you, even if they are not your direct kids. And there's a limited mortgage interest deductibility. Anybody who has a house worth less than $750,000, you're able to deduct your uh, mortgage interest. But anybody has a bigger homes than that, then there's a limit of how much you could deduct. So let's move on. 
some of you, some of my clients have safeguarded their money through putting money into a 529 plans for your kids or grandkids. The new rule says now you could use that money to fund elementary and secondary education. They eliminated the ability to reverse a Roth IRA conversion, however. Most of you don't may not know what that is, but Roth IRA conversion from a traditional was a very popular and still is a very good, good thing to do. But in the past, prior to last year, that if you felt that you didn't like what was happening with your Roth conversion, you had almost a 12 month plus to reverse that if you wanted to and go back to a traditional, but they have eliminated that. So you cannot do that anymore. They finally raised the alternative minimum tax exemptions. For many years since the 1980s, from mid eighties on, the alternative minimum tax was the same amount for a long time. So anybody who had many deductions or they wanted to take the deductions, you still had to pay taxes on certain amount because the government says they have to have the revenues to take care of the bills that our country has. Now the state tax exemptions, most of us, unless uh, you have over almost $12 million, now 11 million, 700,000, unless you have that kind of money, you don't really have to worry about the state tax. Um, but if you do, you know, I'm sure that I'll be sitting down with you and discussing how to safeguard the most of your money or even to how to transfer that money to your kids or grandkids or any of the institutions that you may wanna give the money to. And we could talk about that more in detail when we sit down together. Let's talk about some of the provisions that went in that will be expiring. Your individual tax rate and brackets, unless the government changes it, is already is set to expire in 2025. In addition to that, any larger standard deductions, any repeal on personal exemptions, $10,000 cap on the state and local tax deductions, which also is known as SALT, double child tax credit, the state tax exemption, individual alternative tax minimum narrow, narrowing has, will be, it will be repealed or at least it will expire in 2025. Corporate tax rate cut that went down from 34% down to 21 will expire in 2027 as well of your alimony deductions. I don't think it's gonna be 2025 or 2027. I'm sure there will be a lot of tax changes in upcoming year. We don't know whether that will go into effect as of January 1st, 2021. Most likely I'm told they will work on it and you're going to effect in 2022. <coughs> if tax laws change and if they allow that to start in 2022, this might be the best year this time right now might be the best time to get together with us so that we could plan for your taxes in the future. One of the greatest example is, I know I'm gonna be covering things on the Roth IRAs later on, but whether you decide to convert the traditional IRA or 401k into an IRA and then to Roth, or, <coughs> excuse me, or putting money aside for future needs. So you don't, you don't wanna pay any taxes on your um, qualified money now. It may be wise to take that money even if you don't need it. <clears throat> Let's talk about the long-term capital gains. If you're filing your taxes as a single person, you have up to a $40,000 income, or if you're following your taxes jointly with your spouse, and if it goes up to, uh, to 80,000, anybody who makes that kind of income or less, 
you have a zero taxes due on your long-term capital gains. Anybody who makes over 80,000 joint filer up to 496,000, or if you're filing single, make between the uh, income of 40,000 to 441, then your tax rate will be a 15% for capital gains. <clears throat> if your income's above the 441 single or 496 filing jointly, you will be paying your capital gains rate of 20%. That still is much less than what the highest uh, income tax rate is. Income tax rate is 37% at the high end. It's going to go up to 39.6%, if not higher. And there's a big talk about why is that the long-term capital gains any different than the income tax rate? <clears throat> so if the, if the law comes in and they change the law where the long-term capital gains will be taxed same way as the income tax, you may want to really consider where your investments are. So right now you're paying less taxes and you may be wise to make a plan to make some changes to your financial planning so that even if they change the tax law, you will be able to take advantage of the current law that you're in. The one way to manage your investment related taxes is to consider taking advantage of a tax deferred account. Obviously, any money that's sitting in the bank, any money that's maybe in the stock market, even if you're doing well, if they are not in a qualified plan, meaning the money's not in either an IRA, 401ks, TSPs, and such, then any gains will be taxed. Whereas some of you have taken advantage of, many of you may know one way of doing that is putting your money into what the insurance companies fixed annuities. <coughs> if you do that, any growth will be tax deferred. If you have a Roth account, Roth IRA, not only will be tax deferred, but any growth and any money that you put in will be tax free when you take that out in the future, providing that you kept it for minimum five years and you're above the age of 59 and a half. <clears throat> in 2021, the 401ks, 403Bs, TSPs and such has a maximum contribution limit of $19,500 per person. If you're age 50 plus, there's a catch up contribution limit of additional $6,500. So if you care to set aside as much as you can and you're age 50 plus, you're able to put away up to $26,000 this year. For those of you who doesn't have that offered to you from your employer, you will still be able to put money away into an IRA account. If you're age 50 or less, you could put away 6,000. If you're 50 plus, you could add another $1,000. The combined deduction of 7,000 per person can be set aside. So when do you know whether you're able to put money away and take a tax deduction? Is there a limit how much money you could put away? The answer is absolutely yes. It all depends on you, your tax filing status, your workplace retirement plan coverage, and your income. Some of you are able to put money away at 401ks or 403bs, and on top of that, you could put money away into an IRA account. Some of you will put money away in a 401ks and 403bs and TSPs. In addition to that, you may want to put money away in the Roth IRA. There are some limits on how much money could uh, you have to make in order to get that benefit. So keep, keep in mind how important it is to understand the exact rules. If you have any questions or you'd like to know whether you could qualify for both putting money away into a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, please let us know so we can share the numbers with you.
Let's talk about the rollover limits. Most of you may not be aware, but there's so many changes that went in in 2017, which you got to be aware of. The individual retirement account rollover limit rules remain in 2021 as it was in 20, uh, 20 in 2020. When this rule was established initially in 2015, it allowed anybody who wanted to roll over an IRA into another IRA as much as you wanted. But once the new rule went in, that you could only roll over an IRA to another IRA only one time per year. Let me clarify what I mean by rollover. Okay, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. Let's say that you have several IRA accounts in several different places. Let's say in, in my case, we bank with two or three different banks in Hartford County. So let's say you have three different IRA accounts with the three different banks. And you don't like that idea because it's not earning much. So you wanna roll that into one account, either into a stock market or into an annuity. Well, just keep in mind, this is really important. If you decide to take that, your bank writes the check to you or they move the money into a regular checking account, most people know that you have 60 days to move that money out of there so that you don't get taxed on it. Unless there's a direct transfer from your bank direct to another custodian, you only could do that with the one IRA account per every 12 months per year. So if you have taken advantage of rolling that over from three different banks and all consolidated into one, you have violated the IRA rule. So best way to do it is whoever you want to give the money to, whoever is going to be your custodian, let them go to your bank directly and let them transfer that money to them without you touching it. That's the only way that you're going to be able to show that you really have, have taken advantage of the rollovers without any type of penalty. What about the Roth conversion for 2020? You still could do that. You could, you could do it for 2021 as long as they don't change the rules that you're able to do a conversion. <clears throat> Why is it really important for you to consider doing that now? Well, I know some of you are listening today and some of you have taken advantage of this conversion during this past year. So let me explain how this thing works. Roth conversion means you're converting your traditional qualified money into a non-qualified well, let me correct myself, it, to a qualified Roth account. When you convert from traditional IRA to Roth, whatever the amount of a conversion is, and there is no limit to that. If you happen to have $500,000, 401ks or IRAs, and you want to convert the whole thing, you're able to right now until they change the law. However, if you were to convert the $500,000 from traditional to Roth, that amount will be added to your current income as an additional income and you have to pay taxes on that. Undoubtedly, when you do that, you're gonna be at the highest tax rate. So by the time you add the federal tax rate, your state and local tax, you may be paying close to a 50% in taxes to convert your IRA to Roth. So it's critical that you understand where the limit is. And in order for you to take the most advantage, take advantage of the conversion opportunities, please sit down with your accountant. Please sit down with your advisor, financial advisors who could help you to make sure that you're not taking too much of your traditional IRA to Roth all at once. Some of you know that the best way to do that, maybe perhaps on that situation, is to convert maybe $100,000 a year for the next five years. Only problem with that is 
if they change the rules on the conversion next year in 2022, you're only going to get to do that this year. So please sit down with us. Uh, we'll be asking our staff to follow up with you to make an appointment so that either by Zoom meetings or by you coming in, we could talk about the best way to convert your IRA to Roth IRA. As I said to you, I think in the past, why is it important for you to convert your traditional IRA to Roth? The reason is when you turn a certain age, traditional IRAs, you must take the money out, what they call a required minimum distribution, even if you don't need the money. The new rule went in last year where they defer the age to 72. Prior to last year is if you were 70 and a half, the year that you turn 70 and a half, you have option of taking the required minimum distribution that year, that year on, or if you decide to wait till you're 21, uh, 71, then you have to take the two years worth all at once. And from that point on, when you're 71, 72, 73, you need to take out whatever the required minimum distribution level was. Well, they pushed that age from 70 and a half to 72. So if you are now 70 and a half by July 1st of 2020, you could wait till you're 72 to take the required minimum distribution. There's a reason why you may wanna take the money out of your IRA account way before the age of 72. There's a lot of ways to strategizing your estate is one certainly best way of doing it is again, being active up front, even if you're not that age, take the money out, even if you have to pay taxes on it to figure out if they will help you for your future incomes, income needs. One of the last thing that they have done is now the Roth conversion cannot be undone, even if you want to change, change your mind on that. So once it's converted from a traditional IRA to Roth, you won't be able to go back and make the Roth IRA into traditional. Now, another thing that you got to really keep in mind is if you're not 60 years yet, if you're 55 and you decided to do a type of conversion or put money into a Roth account, not only that you have to leave it in there for five years, but you cannot touch that till you're 59 and a half. Otherwise you'll be paying a lot of penalties and taxes. So I encourage you to sit down with us again, understand the real rules that may affect you. What about giving money to a charity? Well, you could donate your appreciated stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or any other assets that you may have directly to a charity. It's a good way of not paying any taxes on it. If you're already donating money to a charity, why not do that directly? Give them the appreciated stock. And if you're age 72 plus, or you've been taking the required minimum distribution, once you get to starting anybody who's not 72 yet, once you turn 72, either you're going to be needing to take the required minimum distribution or a smart way of doing it is that the custodian send the money directly to your charity without you taking and put them into your bank account <clears throat> and count that as your income for that year. So direct donation might be the best way to handle that. Let's talk about healthcare laws and your taxes. So most of you know, when you're working, you are, they will take out FICA tax out of your paycheck every week or every other week, depends on how you get paid, but you're paying 7.65% of your income was held to send it in under the FICA tax rules. FICA is divided into two sections. Out of the 7.65%, 
6.25% goes 6.2% goes towards your retirement. The other 1.45% is taxed for your future health insurance. Most people, once they turn the age of 65, you're on Medicare. So the Medicare tax, if you want to look at it that way, is 1.45%. However, for all the incomes above $250,000 married people filing jointly, they are taxed at a 2.35%. So you you're paying extra 0.9% in Med Medicare tax. Then there is even a higher limit. Anybody who's making over 496,000, there is an excise tax on top of that to another 3.8%. But whether it is 1.45 or 2.35, or additional 3.8% on top of that, that's a lot of money in taxes that you have to pay. So talk with your advisors to how to limit in your income so that you will pay less taxes. Sit down with us. I will help you to determine that so that make sure when you're taking the income out of your qualified plan, that you are taking it from a proper area so you pay less taxes as much as you can. And any investment income is taxed at Medicare tax of 3.8%. Now, what about the medical expenses? Well, medical expenses can be deducted from your federal income tax as long as your expenses are exceeding 10% of your adjusted gross income. Until you meet that threshold, you don't get to deduct any of your medical expenses. But if it goes above that, you should itemize and you should take the deductions if you think that that's gonna help you with your tax returns. Let's talk about the distribution actions. When you are ready to take distribution from your require from your retirement plan you should take an inventory of all your potential sources of a retirement income and understand that how they will be treated in tax situation whether you will be have to pay taxes on it or not sometimes you may have to adjust your asset allocation so that you have a better chance of not paying taxes with some of your investments that you may hold. And don't forget whether you need it or not, this required minimum distributions will be coming to you once you turn to age 72 and older. As we already said, obviously you can, if you don't need the money, send have your custodians send your RMDs directly to a charity of your choice so you don't have to add that to your income. It's always best to manage your taxes up front rather than waiting for government to tell you what you need to do. It's the same way as you will be. Don't wait till 2022 to find out from the government what you should have done. There's a many things you could do now in the next few months so that you would pay as little taxes as you can. Let's talk about the diversification of your assets. There is no guarantee that just because you have a diversified your accounts that you will not lose in the stock market or not even if he's not in the stock market and he kept your money in the bank. We're very lucky in the last few years, our inflation rate's been very, very low. But as amount of money has added to our national debt, currently we're hitting very close to the $30 trillion. And I'm sure within the next couple of years, you'll go up to $35 trillion. When that happens, inflation will be back. And if you have your money tied up in the CDs, three years, five year CD earning at 1.5, one, 2.2%, 1 and yet inflation rate is three, 4% two years from now, you're actually losing ground. 
your purchasing power will go down because you're not earning enough to offset the inflation. So make sure that you are smart enough to understand not only to safeguard your money in a bank account, but understand that you need to have your money grow. Even if it's a nominal number, you should be above the inflation number. So please sit down with us if you have any questions on that. Gift tax exclusions. Well, once again, this may or may not affect you, but everyone who wants to give money away, you have a right to do that. You could give it to whoever you want. It, it does not have to be your family members. Any person could give money up to $15,000 to another person without paying any taxes on that money you're giving away. If you give more than 15,000 gift to someone to take it out of your estate, let's say you give someone $30,000, first 15,000 of that is exempted, so you don't have to pay taxes on that. But the other 15,000 you're giving away, you have to pay taxes on that. Not the one who's receiving the money, the person who's giving the money have to file the paperwork and you have to pay taxes on it. So it may be wise to understand the rules and try to figure out how best to gift the money out without paying taxes. And we could help you with that area as well. So should you invest your money in treasuries? Whether you believe it or not, or whether things have changed, still our country is the best place to put the money. Our treasuries are paying very little in interest right now. Until the end of last year, our 10-year bonds was paying less than 1%. It was hovering around 0.5 to 0.7% all last year. Now it's above 1%. Even if it goes back up to 2%, 2.5%, you're not going to make a lot of money by putting your money into your treasuries. However, it's safe. It's backed by the U.S. government. So understand that safety will be there for you, but the interest you earn might be very minimal. It's important for you to also understand not only... You know, one thing about not paying taxes so that people will put their money into a muni bonds or any type of tax exempt municipals. Well, if you're earning 1% and you don't pay any taxes on that, let's assume that you bought the muni bonds from the state of Maryland, some type of revenue bonds, meaning that you don't pay taxes on the federal level as well as the state level. So if you got 100,000 and earn 1%, how much have you really earned? Thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. If you don't pay any taxes, you get to keep that thousand. But if you had that exact amount of money, hundred thousand dollars, earning a three percent in taxable vehicle, even only at three percent, that's three thousand dollars. And even if you're at the highest tax rate, you're still making minimum of fifteen hundred dollars net or it could be above $2,000, which will be greater than the amount of money that you have earned in treasuries. Diversification is important, but make sure to understand the best place to put your money. And also treasuries are subject to the interest rate risk. If you lock up your money at lower rate and interest rate goes up, the value of your account goes down. So that might not be the best time to do it. When the interest rate's low, this might be the worst time to put your money in the treasuries. Unless there's a more room for interest rates to go down. I don't know how they could go down as much more than what they have right now. So be careful with that. And also we talked about giving appreciated assets to a charity. If you have any type of stocks, any type of um, investments that you want to give it away, give it directly to, to a charity so that you can safeguard uh, your future income opportunities without paying much in taxes. Now, 
we have gone through most of our uh, presentation except for some of the questions that you may have. So let me get a few questions that, where are the questions? Okay, did anybody type anything in? Okay. Okay, here's one question, local question. It says, Hogan said that no un unemployment income is taxable in 2020. Where on Form 502 or elsewhere do I show that unemployment income as a deduction? Well, you know what? That's a real good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly where in Form 502. I need to look into that. And I I'll ask our accountant to look into that and get back to you with that answer. So some of the questions that I get is, you know, whether that you should take the RMDs now or should you wait till the government comes up with any rulings on that as it did last year. If you recall last year, the RMD was a lot, you were allowed to not take the RMDs and most of you did not. And the question I got from someone who just typed in says, the date for filing taxes last year was pushed back to July. Is there any chance it will be pushed back this year? Well, it could. We don't know exactly how this COVID's gonna be working out. We don't know whether we'll be able to have enough vaccination so that uh, most people will get back to work at some point this year. But if this takes longer than they're anticipating, I'm sure the government will decide maybe instead of paying your taxes by April 15, maybe they're pushed back to sometime later in the year. And it goes along with the same thing with the RMDs. Since you didn't have to take the last year, any chance that there would be a uh, pushback again or not needing to take it, Folks, even if they say that you don't need to take the RMD, you really need to figure out if that's an opportunity for you to go ahead and take it and do something with that money. It's not always best just to defer your money so that you don't have to pay taxes today. I'm in one of those believed person that tax rate will go up in the future, not going down. So it all depends on your personal situation, but I'd rather pay certain tax rate when I know what that is versus waiting till finding out if there is gonna be a tax rate increase, how much more I have to pay in the future. Number three question uh, just came in. It says, is there any way I can put away more money for my retirement if I'm already maximizing my 401k contribution? As I already went over with your earlier, it all depends on your income level. Even if you're able to put away maximum maximum amount, and this person who uh, sent this in, I know the person is over 50 years old. So I'm assuming that maximum is not only 19,500, but you're also gonna put away extra 6,500, the total of 26,000. If you make certain income level, you're it be able to put away in more than just in your 401k. Sometimes you can add it to a traditional IRA. Some of you may want to put the money into a Roth IRA account. Some of you who may not qualify to put away any more money may want to consider putting money into a different products and services that are out there that may benefit to create a large legacy for your family. So once again, you know, specific questions like this, probably is best for us to sit down so I could help you to figure that out. Oh, here's the great question that just came in. It's the last one I take. So when should I start taking my social security and why? Well, traditionally people were retiring at age of 65. So they took the social security at 65. Now the full retirement age has gone past that. 
many of you who's retiring this year, if you're retiring in 2021, your full retirement age is 66 years old. You know, you don't have to wait till you're 66 to collect social security. You could receive that as early as age of 62. Just keep in mind, if you take it at age 62 rather than age 66, you will get about 25% less in social security income. If I were to ask you to assume that your full retirement age, because you put a lot of money into the system, let's say it's gonna be a 3,000 a month when you retire at 66. That means if you were to take that income at 62, you will be collecting $2,250 a month, full 25% less for the rest of your life. Obviously they will add any cost of living adjustments but even at that, you're going to be collecting much less. So when should you take it? Should you wait till your full retirement age or should you take it early? Well, everyone's different. I could tell you in my personal situation, my sister, who's 62 years old, she's taking her Social Security at that age. Even though, even if she doesn't need the money, I told her to go ahead and take it. The reason being, she's by herself. So if she doesn't take the money and she just let it grow to full retirement age of 66 or even beyond that, and something happens to her in the meantime, she would never have gotten any money out of the social security system. So she's going to take it. On the other hand, I'm planning on waiting till I'm even age 70 to take it. The reason is the longer I wait, more money I will have. In this scenario, which I just shared with you, if my full retirement age was 66 and I were to get 3,000 a month, by simply waiting till I'm age 70, which will be the latest I wait, I get extra 32%. So instead of getting a $3,000, I would be collecting over $4,000 per month in social security. On top of that, they're added four more years of cost of living adjustment. So if they were to have 2% of growth, I'm actually going to get extra 40% when I turn age 70. So it all depends on you. It's important for you to really put that into your perspective of financial planning so that when you're figuring out when to take it, it's always best to know not only your social security planning, but how your rest of your assets are gonna treat your uh, tax returns. A lot of times it's best to coordinate all so that you pay as little as you can. Folks, I know it's been a, while, a long time. I think I took a little over, what, almost 45 minutes or so. So I wanna thank you for being with us. Please think about what I say and give us a call. If you get busy and we call you, uh, give us an opportunity to get together with you. So make an appointment. Thank you again. And please, please keep safe and be healthy. God bless you. Bye-bye now.